Hello, Habit Mechanics. It's Dr. John Finn here. Hope you've had a good week so far. Welcome back. So we've been talking about very specific chapters of the Habit Mechanic book over the last few episodes. We're going to take a, a break from that, this episode, and we're going to focus in onto a Forbes, one of my recent Forbes articles, which I just think is really relevant and will be really interesting for people. I'm increasingly hearing how difficult it is for people to be at their best. And I don't think that's going to get any easier. So hopefully some of the insights we share today can get you thinking about some simple and practical things you can do for yourself, but for others to make it easier to be our best, do better, feel better in the, the challenging world that we're all living in. So the focus of the, of the Forbes article is why traditional coaching is broken and how to fix it using a new science-based approach. So I'm also joined today by my friend and colleague, Andrew Whitelam. Andrew, how are you doing? Yeah, hi, John. Yeah, great to be uh, to be with you again. Uh, I'm looking forward to this podcast. Uh, you're a, a regular contributor to Forbes magazine, which is uh, uh, very well recognised both in the US and in the UK, if people are not aware of it, it's published uh, in um, in both countries, and you can read uh, your article online. So Forbes magazine certainly a, a publication that people take notice of, and I'm looking forward to getting into the article and discussing the detail of it. Um, we'll also be taking uh, well talking about someone's question that we've 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 taken, and we can take your questions. Please do submit them to us via the website tougherminds.co.uk. And of course, it'd be great if everyone would like, share, and uh, review this podcast uh, on on the podcast platform of their choice. Yes, and if you if your question gets selected, you win one year's free premium membership to the Habit Mechanic University app. The Haven Mechanic University app is free. You can get it from the App Store and the Google Play Store. So it's on um, iOS and Android. And if we pick your question, you win a free one-year premium subscription. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, something that uh, is going to be very beneficial for people. And uh, yeah, I, I use the Habit Mechanic University app every day, as I know you do, John, uh, free to download, as you say, and really worthwhile. Uh, I would encourage people to do that. Um, but turning to your Forbes article, then, um, as you say, the thrust of it is that uh, executive coaching as it exists at the moment, the vast majority of it, the, the vast body of it that doesn't recognize the pivotal role that habits play in our lives. And we're going to talk in detail about what you mean by that exactly. Um, you also identify nine core factors that uh, affect what people do and crucially what people think um, every day, every moment of their lives. And we're going to talk about those in detail too and talk about how people can use those practically in their lives and also uh, some examples some fascinating examples you have of, of them at play where people are trying to perform to their best and people are trying to really reach the the top of their particular profession and we'll go into those later in the podcast but in the Forbes article you start by setting the context if you like and you you outline that uh we live in a very challenging world so it's not surprising that that people in business and in high performing roles in pressurized roles are seeking this coaching and this psychological support on, on such a great level yeah the term the VUCA world volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world has been around for a number of years, originally coined by the American military. But I think the post-pandemic world has just taken it to a new level. So for me, the post-pandemic world is like the VUCA world on steroids. Um, and ultimately, we all want to be, well, I, I've certainly never met anyone who doesn't want to be happy. Most people, and, and to be happy, feeling like you're achieving and making progress and, and getting results is a really important part of that, feeling like you've got control over your life. That is much more difficult to do, I think, than ever before. And I think the challenge we face is that even if we want to do better and 
you know, many people are, are striving all the time. If you go to someone like the BBC website, it's littered with um, articles about how to feel better, how to do better, how to, you know, be mentally well, how to perform to your potential. People are looking for these things all the time. We know that the number of people that are working with coaches has hugely increased and that profession has hugely increased. But the challenge we face is that these traditional approaches to helping us to do better are focused on giving us more knowledge, so more knowledge about what we need to do to be our best. And, you know, I've got three psychology-related degrees, and in my in my taught degrees, my master's and my um, undergraduate, that was also the thrust of how I was taught. I was taught if you get people to know what, what to do to be at their best, then you've done your job. But of course, we don't do what we know we should do. We now know we do what we're in the habit of doing. And I'll, I'll come back and unpick that. But a really simple example of that is most people know and agree it's a good idea to walk 10,000 steps a day, yet the NHS is still spending half its annual budget, tens of billions a year because people on diseases that emerge because people don't do those things. We know that it's not a good idea to get overly stressed and to worry too much, but it doesn't stop us you know, doing that. We know that it's a better, it's a good idea to get high quality sleep um, or to turn off our distractive devices when we're trying to focus and concentrate. So knowing and, and doing are two different things. And this is, this is what I hear for senior leaders in businesses as well. We know what we want our people to do to help us to help the business achieve its goals, but it's really hard and in fact harder than ever to get people to do those things. So really the, the crux of it is this knowing versus doing challenge that we're facing. Um, and we need to move beyond that now because we've got much better insights into how human brains work and why people do what they do. And perhaps we could go on a bit of a journey to explain more about that. Yes, and in the Forbes article, John, you you talk about um, the, the, this this explosion in coaching, and um, and then you come on to talk about the pivotal role in habits, the the pivotal role of habits, and and tackle that in detail. What do you mean? What what do what do you talk about when you you describe this this role that habits play to people in in your in the work you do with your clients in business? Yeah, so. This is the way I think about it now, is that, um, first of all, so I, my opening insights there were really about how we used to think about helping people to do better. Well, let me reframe that. How I used to think about helping people to do better, the way I was taught to do it, I still think that's the prevailing approach. But I became dissatisfied with the way I used to do it. I didn't think it worked and that's what we spent you know over, over 20 years over 25,000 hours creating a different approach that actually helps people to do better by using new insights from science but the, the way I now think about it and, and now understand it is that brains run us they run us individually they run us collectively so brains run your business they run your team they run you they are running our lives and it it's easy to forget that because our brain is inside our skull. We can't see it. Um, no one's, you know, for the for the for, for the vast majority of people, no one's ever taught them about their brain or how it works, even though it's driving everything that they're doing. So it's kind of invisible to us. So if we if we want to take a scientific approach to being at our best, to give us the best chance of being at our best, that's the starting point. So if we're using first principle thinking. Brains run our lives, brains run our organization, brains run our teams, they run our people. The second principle that we now understand is that habits run brains or brains run on habits. This is, we, we've had a sense about the about habits being important for quite a while, but the significance of habits is only just being understood. So 
I've said before that I think pop psychology has done a really bad job on habits because it hasn't really presented the full picture of how powerful they are. If you know someone like Daniel Kahneman's work, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, and he won a Nobel Prize for his work in that area, Kahneman's talking about habits. He calls them heuristics, but he's talking about habits, talking about automatic and semi-automatic thinking and doing, and that's what habits are. And what we've started to understand in the last few years is that, in fact, the vast majority of what we think and do, at least 98%, is automatic or semi-automatic thinking and doing, or in other words, behavior. That's a minimal. Sometimes we're running on 100% mindless behavior. It is running on instinct. Yeah, it's, it's possibly worth repeating that, John, just to underscore it for people. 98% of everything we do and think, think that's a crucial one for me. And possibly at some at some point, 100% is habitual. Yes. And, you know, many, many of us don't realize that we're thinking all the time. I certainly didn't until I studied these fields in lots of detail. But it's quite easy to recognize this. If I just say to you, notice now how you're talking to yourself. And if you don't think you're talking to yourself, notice how you've just said to yourself, I'm not talking to myself, is there all the time. So we're thinking all the time. And most of that thinking is mindless, automatic, subconscious behavior. So habits drive our biases. They drive our belief systems. So when you meet someone new for the first time, if you meet someone new today for the first time, you've never met them before, you will make a judgment about that person's entire life history in about five seconds. That is not a conscious process. That's a, a shortcut. It's a habitual shortcut because our brain, we know, is, decide, is designed to serve energy. But this is understanding. So we're not uh, conscious or we have a tiny bit of consciousness that is depleted very, very quickly. And I would argue it's depleted faster than ever in the post-pandemic world where it's harder than ever to get your brain working well. In other words, sleep well, eat properly, exercise properly, etc. So brains run us, they run our businesses. Habits run brains. That's the key thing to understand. So humans are not logical um we are well intended i think most people are very well intended but we are i think when you consider that we're running on habits it it, it certainly changes the way i think about what people do and trying to help them to do things differently and for me people are more like supercomputers than what we traditionally think as a as a conscious logical um yeah human being we're running on automatic and the fact we are like supercomputers means that our potential is immense but unfortunately it's becoming easier and easier to develop habits that are less and less helpful for us being at our best so for me the, the thing that we need to think about if we want to help ourselves and others to be at our best, isn't that term human capital, it's habit capital. And our habits are our most powerful and precious resource. It's like we've got this gold mine inside us that if we learn how to untap it and how to unlock it, we've got this just fantastic resource waiting to be unleashed for feeling better, doing better, being at our best, helping others to be at their best. And then again, in the Forbes article, once you've set this context, if you like, once you set out that context, which is, is very compelling, um, you point out that that is the starting point for people 
trying to improve themselves, trying to be their best. And for anyone coaching people, if you're a coach, once you recognize that context, that's then the platform to, to begin supporting people to reach their, their well-being, their performance goals, and their perhaps their leadership goals as well. And and that that uh, that is the, the the non-negotiable, if you like, if you want to achieve that. Um, and then you go on to to describe these nine core factors that um, are uh, essential when you want to build helpful habits. You you cite this idea of of helpful habits, and I understand, John, um, you've recently developed a new tougher minds talk, which is focused on this area. And you're going to be delivering that at a, a, um, in the first instance and for the first time very soon at um, a significant venue in England related to high performance sport. Yeah, so one of the things that we feel is a, prior- a priority for us at the moment is just to engage more people is just to speak to more people and and give more people access to these cutting edge insights that are so powerful for them and those that they're trying to help. So we created a new range of Tougher Minds talks, which are essentially keynotes. Um, We've been doing keynotes for many, many years, but we've just brought everything up to date, building in the Habit Mechanic book and the app so that we don't just... People don't just go to a talk and say, oh, that was really interesting. I'm going to do all these things. But then once they leave the room, they never take any action and they, they forget it. They, for, they forget about it. And the, their notes never see the light of day again. We've deliberately built these Tougher Minds talks so that people get the Habit Mechanic book. They get access to the app so they can continue using um, the Habit Mechanic, Habit Metrics and Habit Mechanic Toolkit to keep building new habits. And yes, on Thursday, I'm speaking at St. George's Park, which is the FA's, the Football Association's HQ. I'm actually speaking for um, for a business called 59 Club. They work in the golf sector. They work for the biggest golf resorts in the world, including places like St. Andrews in the UK, um, Augusta um, in the US. And they they start their the work they do um, by doing mystery shopping. So they go to the venues and they essentially look at the behaviour of the staff in the venue and they give a measurement to that behaviour. So they're essentially measuring people's habits. They wouldn't they they don't yet call it that, but I'm I'm working with uh with them to think about it in a, in a different way. And they essentially say, well, this is where your people's habits are. Uh, this is the this is the benchmark. So this is what good looks like. This is what excellent looks like. And this is where your people are. But then the next step is, well, how do we help them to actually change habits? And that's what we're also working with uh, 59 Club on. But the specific talk that we're giving at St. George's Park, I'm, I'm giving it with uh, the Olympic gold medalist, Tim Foster, who's now also the... Um, performance director at the League Managers Association, which is the the association for Premier League managers and uh, professional soccer managers in the UK, really a high esteem body. Uh, so Tim's speaking as well. And, all, and so is Steve Bruce, the three times uh, Premier League winner and a long serving football manager across many different teams. So and there's going to be a hundred people in my talk and everyone's going to get the book. Everyone's getting the habit mechanic book and they're going to get access to the app as well so that they can continue to use these ideas. And I will be showing them how to start to activate these nine action factors that we're going to talk about for themselves, but these people are managers um, and also for their teams. So yeah, uh, that's Tougher Minds Talks. And as you know, Andrew, we've set these up to be different. So they're not the same as a, as a bog standard keynote. And I know you've been really enthused about the detail, the details of that. Yeah, that's right, John. And, and if anyone does want any information about the new Tougher Minds Talks, if they go to the Tougher Minds website, 
tougherminds.co.uk. Um, look under the heading keynotes on the menu and there's um, a page there explaining and setting out how um, the, the, the Tougher Minds talks work and uh, just worth highlighting how people after after these it will be on a pathway to feeling happier more focused and able to fulfill the potential uh, it's a very high impact experience uh, much more than a keynote as you say um people leave feeling they have far more control over their lives and you let you'll be uh, delivering um guidance on how to use as you say your proprietary habit metrics assessment tools so people can intelligently self-watch themselves and identify destructive habits and helpful super habits um again people will leave understanding more about motivation and how to make positive change to improve their performance, their leadership and their happiness. And, and you share more than 30 award-winning habit mechanic tools in, in, in your Tougher Minds talks and highlight how to eliminate destructive habits from your lives and start building new helpful super habits and move on to resilience as well. You, you explain what really, really works and how to build resilience effectively um and as you say using the book in tandem with the talk and the habit mechanic university app as well um you, you will connect those up for people and you can influence people around you as well you will gain an understanding of that um and um have a, an instant ability to start delivering benefits for people so absolutely packed with with benefit and and content and substance and i think uh, it's well worth um any type of organization or business checking out the new Tougher Minds talks. As I say, you'll find more details and, and details of how to schedule a Tougher Minds talk on the Tougher Minds website, uh, tougherminds.co.uk, and just look under the keynotes heading. So that's certainly um, something worthwhile for, for anyone and any type of organization of any size to check out. But let's, if we can, John, go back to the, the the Forbes article that we've been discussing and is the is the subject of our podcast today. Um, and after setting out that context and the background, which is which is essential and and so useful, you then talk about how it's important for nine core factors to be used if people do want to start building new helpful habits. Uh, and and supercharge their performance and we'll go through these nine um one at a time and and, and talk about them in detail and, and gain your your insight which is a um a, a tremendous uh opportunity for, for people and don't forget also we'll be uh reviewing a question we've had and people can submit their questions via the website uh please do that uh, and we will certainly um look at them on the podcast and you can win uh, that premium access to the Habit Mechanic University app when it becomes available uh, for a year. So very worthwhile submitting a question. But let's look at the nine factors then, John. And the first of them you cite is mindset. Uh, you talk about mindset being essential for, for changing unhelpful habits. Yes. And not to derail your schedule here, Andrew, I, I think it would be useful just to take a step backwards before we go into these nine factors and just, just dig a bit more into some examples that compelled me there was a better way to do this. And I think that will give the nine action factors some more context. So we'll, we'll go into mindset shortly and the other factors, but just as I was thinking about this podcast today and, and part of when I was writing the article as well, it reminded me of previous experiences that I'd had. So if we go back to this, this thread of brain runners, they run our businesses, they run our teams, habits run brains. It's harder than ever to build helpful habits. The fourth thing to understand is that the traditional ways we've been trying to help people to be at their best are not based on insights about how brains actually work, which the nine action factors are, we'll, we'll, we will come on to that. So that most of the things we're using to try to help people to do better are not factoring in, in how brains actually work. Now, the core reason for that is because most of these approaches were designed before we actually understood how brains worked. We've only been able to look inside uh, brains for about 20, 25 years. And it's taken us a while to make sense of what all that data means. 
So, and when I say look inside, I mean look inside in real time using technologies like functional MRI scanners. So, whether it's coaching, whether it's psychometric, whether it's models about um, what humans really need to be at their best, the the standard ones that are being used were developed before we actually understood how brains worked. And they were developed maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. I mean, the, the foundations of the core psychometric tools we use were, were developed about 100 years ago. So they're not considered, they're not based with an understanding of how brains work. And that's why they don't really work. You know, And there's very established neuroscientists saying, for example, that you know, psychometrics are about as predictive as a horoscope. Um, that's quite that's quite alarming, John. Really, when you 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 know, many of us will have perhaps been in a work context where the the, the uh, well meaning people have said, "Well, we're going to do a psychometric test here. It might it's going to be helpful, and we're going to base some personal development on it." Even. Yeah, and it's really I, I think it's really interesting because you you do you, I suppose you take a psychometric, and I've taken them. What what are we imagining that psychometrics doing? Are we imagining that it can read? It reads us and it has an absolute, gives us absolute clarity as what we're really designed to do. So it's got some kind of secret, secret insights about who we are, what we're good at. I mean, the fact that I can't really articulate what I think a psychometric is supposed to do would maybe shine a light on. Well, you just think if someone says, take this, it's a good thing to do, you just take it and take that it is a good thing to do. Um, there's actually, there's a docu a HBO documentary. I think it's called Persona, and it's um, the 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 protagonist in the documentary. And it's a it's a very new documentary. Is a an Oxford or a Cambridge academic who wrote a book um, about her bad experience with psychometrics, but her journey started. She went to a top top university. She got a got into a top top graduate uh, program, and week one of that graduate program, all the graduates went away on a big residential, and they had this battery of psychometrics that they took, and she felt that the psychometric test, you know, almost just said, "Well, this is what your the rest of your life is going to be like," and that didn't sit very well with her. So she started to dig into well, where did these psychometric tools actually come from? What were they designed for? Who designed them? What's the validity? What's the reliability? I think, well, I, I know that psycho psychology is is the is the least tangible sort of performance service, well being service. And when I say what I mean by that is, you know, sleep training is a real tangible thing you can do. Nutrition is a real tangible thing. Tangible thing. Psychology is really intangible because it's about how you think and thinking is invisible. And I just think that psychometrics you know, really well intended, but now the data is showing is not, not very effective. And I, I'd argue, and I would argue really that they're actually really damaging. They're, they're just attractive because they make something that's really intangible, really tangible. And they suggest that they're going to give us more control over our life, over our lives. I think they actually create very deterministic mindsets. Um, they give us a, narr a fixed narrative about ourselves, what we can do and what we can't do. And we know from uh, Professor Carol Dweck's work how damaging deterministic mindsets are. She would call them fixed mindsets, which speaks to the the mindset factor and the non-action factors, which we'll come on to. Um, yeah, and you know, I mean, another another example of kind of models that are still regularly used is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, which we also know really, really well intended. About sixty years old, cited. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I guarantee you, globally, will be cited thousands, if not tens of thousands, of times today, and will be used as a framework to say to people, "This is these are the key things that are really important for you." feeling happy um but it's a fundamentally flawed model because it was designed before we actually understood how brains worked so 
these traditional approaches that were designed before we actually understood how brains work to called black box theories because they almost trap humans human brains as a black box they weren't understanding what was going on inside the brain they were just making assessments about input and output and i, I talk a lot about this in the habit mechanic book and i gave a i give a real simple example in chapter four i think about roger bannister and how roger bannister used sophisticated scientific insights about his training and running technique that allowed him to be the first person to be to run the sub four minute mile so if you want to really understand what i mean by black box theories you can read chapter four it's really simple um and just to point out there, John, you're citing, you're almost drawing a parallel with sports science, which is obviously physiological about the body and the science, the detailed science required to really understand what's going on inside the body there and the detailed science required to understand what's going on in the brain. Absolutely. And I would say that what I would, what I would now call habit science can do, habit science can do... Um, What's the right way to, to frame this? So let me just put a bit of context around this. If if we go back in time about 20 years, um, professional sports started to introduce sports scientists into the backroom staff. So they started to, to bring insights from the science of physiology, from biology, from nutrition. And they started to use those insights to brain and condition their athletes in a different way. That was driven because people like Arsene Wenger, the famous Arsenal manager, Clive Woodward, the famous England rugby union uh, coach, they just wanted to use every competitive advantage they could to help their teams win. And they saw the physical conditioning side of the of of their sports as something that that could be hugely improved. So they brought in these sports scientists. Because of the success those teams got, they almost forced everybody's hand, everybody else's hand into doing it um, and taking the same approach. And, I, and when I started my professional work as a as a psychologist, if, if you like, after I'd done my, my um, master's in sports psychology, I was on that first wave of people going into professional sports teams under that sports science umbrella. And now what we see in terms of physical conditioning of professional athletes today in 2023 versus 20 years ago is there's a seismic difference. And now the gains you can make in physical conditioning are getting smaller and smaller because they're taking it, you know, they've really, really uh, used sports science to uncover every sort of performance stone advantage stone for me habit science can do for happiness for performance for leadership development for team performance for culture what sports science did for physical conditioning in professional sport this is this is why i'm really excited about this work this is why we wrote the book the habit mechanic we released the app that's why we do this podcast because we want to spread the word about the power of habit science and help people to use it to unlock their own and other people's potential. Yeah, that's an absolutely uh, fascinating and very concise uh, summary uh, of, of the whole um, purpose, I suppose, um, of this podcast, as you say, and and uh, and tougher minds. Um, John, you, uh, we digress slightly, which was my fault. We, you, you were about to talk uh, before that fascinating uh, dive um, into that aspect um, of habits. We were about to talk about some specific examples um, which you'd come across in your career, I think related to elite sport. And you, you were connecting that, of course, to your forthcoming appearance at St. George's Park where you're giving a top of mind talk. So um, before we go on to look in detail at uh, these nine core factors, I, I think I started off with, with mindset. But um, yeah, if you would, uh, please share with us some of those examples. Yeah, and... Just to connect what we've been saying to these examples. So these coaches, these people that are providing this advice, they're doing it, I'd, I'd argue, with two hands tied behind their back because the information they've had about how to help people 
do better. You know, they were t they were taught this in good faith. They learned this in good faith. Wasn't actually based on how brains worked, which is bizarre. And you know, one of my colleagues, uh, our head of education, Andrew Foster, you know, he's he's he has a he because he's seen the power of of tougher minds in in his work in education. He sees that when you teach this to young people when you give parents access to this, when you give teachers access, it just changes the entire landscape of learning. And he, and he kind of likens um, the current approach to helping people as to what the, the medical doctors were doing, you know, over a hundred years ago, which we sometimes see in old films um, about where that we didn't understand human, uh, the, the autonomy of the human body. So we're having to go in there and poke around and you know look at things. That that's almost where the the professions about helping people to do better, whether we want to call it coaching or something else, have been. They've had their hands tied behind their back. That doesn't have to be the case anymore. But yeah, so one of these examples, I don't want to share, I don't want to share names because I think that's a little bit dis disrespectful, but these, these are all true stories of well, the, the main this story I'm going to tell now is, is a true is is a true story. So, I, when I was right in the the mix working in professional sport, I got invited to um, a coaching conference of one of the major team sports in the UK. I, I want to keep that level of confidentiality about it. And so, we were sitting in a lecture theatre in one of our big sporting universities. And in front of us was the attack coach for the national team showing video footage from the first team, the national team's a recent training session before a test match where they'd been beaten quite badly. And this team was in pretty bad form. It, it, it had been hugely successful a few years before they were world number one. They were just champ the champions. They couldn't lose, basically. Change, in, change of management, change of player. Uh, some players changed, etc. So this attack coach now is part of the backroom staff of a team that's not doing particularly well. But he showed the video footage of the training session, and it was showing the team running through some players. So it was a sort of a bird's eye image of the the field where there was the starting um, if I if I say how many people it were it gives a spot away but it was a starting yeah, careful there John careful <laughs> of, of players versus you know like a the starting a, team <laughs> the starting team versus a mock opposition yeah but the coach was basically saying so in this in in the test match that had happened in between this uh, coaching session or this I suppose they call it a run through. So, yeah, in the test match that happened in between, there'd been a lot of criticism about the set players of this team. And he was spotlighting how successful the set players were in this sort of dummy run of the of the um of the preparation for the game. But I, I was just I mean, I didn't ha really understand habit science at the time like I did, because this was this was 10 plus years ago. But I was thinking that I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, the players performing those skills in the context you're showing us is just not equivocal at all to what they're doing in the test match. And the fact that the guy didn't understand that was really worrying for me because he'd done all the training, he's done all the education that his governing body said he needed to do in order to become an elite coach. But he wasn't being taught that there's a big difference between practicing and performing skills in this context versus performing skills in this high pressure context of a, of a, of a test match. So going back to the whole overarching point of what we're talking about, they thought that if they could get the players to know what they should do and the players could demonstrate that they could do that, then they'd be able to do it again and again and again. What in in the in whatever context? 
what was missing was the understanding of habits. And what actually happened in the test match was the players default back to habits. And that's, I think that's it's quite difficult, you know, sometimes to understand when we're seeing teams like a Manchester, Manchester City, they're not conscious, those players are not consciously thinking about what they're doing. They are literally running on autopilot. They are just drilled into playing like that. Yeah, there's a tiny bit of consciousness like for all of us, but most of what they're doing is just automatic, habitual behaviour that they've learned and they've practised and they've drilled into their bodies, if you like. Um, and John, if I can just stop you there momentarily, I know just if, if anyone listening is really interested in elite sport, what you're saying there, then that even then, even the decision making is habitual, even the reading of the play, as people would say in a sporting context, that's habitual too, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. We can see that through eye tracking, you know, what do people look at? So the more expert you become, for example, um, so if you just take tennis, the more expert you become as a tennis player, the more you focus on predicting what your opponent's going to do rather than looking at the ball, for example. So novices will look at the ball coming to them. Experts will look at the movement of the shoulder and the, you know, the back lift. They're predicting what's going to happen. And I think this is what we're seeing, for example, with the England cricket team right now. We've got these highly skilled uh, batsmen, for example, who are now playing multiple formats of the game. 12 months ago, it was said that this team um, didn't have the skills, essentially, to perform at test match level in the international arena. Now, they're pretty much unbeaten in in, in 12 months. And if you, were if you were going to take the stats from the last 12 months, they're the number one team in the world. And it's because, I would say, that you know when confidence is low, when everyone's trying to help you to do better as a batsman, the obvious thing to do is to go back to technique and to think about what are you doing with your hands, what are you doing with the bat, rather than relying on your instinct. And what Brendan McCullen's done when he's come in and also via Ben Stokes' captain say, is just given everyone the confidence to go out and play on instinct is essentially what they're saying. Don't overthink it. Just play what you see. Don't worry about your technique. Your international test cricketers, you've got your technique's good enough. We don't have to fiddle about with that. So that yeah, they're literally playing on habit. You know how if if you're facing a ninety mile an hour ball, you don't have a lot of time to think there <laughs> consciously. So it has to be instinct. It has to be um, habit. And we know that you know the more in that very if you get into to sport and physical movement the more you consciously think about the physical movement, the slower and more cumbersome it becomes. Um, you know, I've spent, I mean, I've written motor control modules at university level, so I've, um, I've got a lot of understanding about how that actually happens. So what we're always going back to is, it's not about knowing. If we can just know what to do, we'll be able to do it. And it's not about just doing it a few times in practice. So look, they can do it now. We've taught them what to do. We've taught them how to do the set piece. We've taught them how to execute the move. They're on the practice field. Look, they can do it now. Fantastic. We're in business. It's about habits. And if you want to develop better habits, there's a set of rules that you need to activate. Yeah. And uh, th thanks, John, for, <laughs> well, firstly, uh, again, I think I I've, asked you to uh, digress again so apologies for that but thanks for the sharing that example and uh the fascinating it was and, and also that uh, additional insight you gave about the current uh, performance of the england cricket team i'm sure many people who follow sport will will find that fascinating um but we, we can now come on to to the to the nine key factors and before yes yeah, so before we go there if you want to learn more about the performing under pressure piece I've written an entire chapter about that in the Habit Mechanic book, which is chapter 24, where I really, you know, get into the bones of that. And also if you read chapter 26, which is our learning chapter, that, sh that sheds a lot more light on that. But yeah, the nine action factors. 
ask yeah. away, Andrew. You have yeah, to yeah, thank, thank permission to ask me about the non-action factor. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, no, fascinating. And and by the way, great that uh, the Habit Mechanic book is uh, written the way it is by yourself so people can dip into these chapters and gain great insight. It's really worthwhile checking out if you haven't already done so. Yeah, so uh, back to the Forbes article again. Nine core factors that drive what we think and do. And whether it's uh, someone working on their own or, or a coach or a, a member of a, a team within a business uh, working with clients or people to, to try and get those factors working in their favor to improve performance, well-being, leadership, all these things. Uh, the first one of these is, is mindset. The right mindset is essential, you say. Yeah, we call it the habit mechanic mindset. And just to speak briefly about the non-action factors, so essentially the, the thrust of what we're saying is, is that brains brains drive what we do. We run Brains run our lives, they run our businesses, they run our teams, they run us individually, they run us collectively. Habits run brains. It's harder than ever to build and sustain helpful habits. And the traditional approaches we're using to help us to do that are not designed with the brain in mind. They were designed before we actually understood how brains work. So they're flawed. They don't work. In fact, I would argue often they do more damage than good. And this is partly why more people than ever are struggling because the perversity of the current situation is more people are struggling than ever before, but more people are also seeking support than ever before. And I'd argue a lot of the support they're getting isn't actually helping them to do better. And I hear that a lot. So what we've done is we've taken the, the latest insights from neuroscience, from evolutionary science, from brain maturation science, from powerful emotional regulation science. We've created our own um, behavioral science backed change method which is an action factor model and we've created the habit mechanic approach so we can actually help people to do better so we know that if you want to build new habits if you want to move from knowing to doing to habit there are nine factors that drive your habits and they're always on these factors are always on they're on right now in your life it's just that they're invisible to you so your mindset is on you believe what you believe you know, and broadly, you can think of mindset on a continuum. One end is, I believe that I can grow and I can get better and I can improve. That's a habit mechanic mindset. The other end of the continuum is what we might call the, the eight brain mindset, which is, no, I'm good at what I'm good at. My genes dictate that. And if I'm not good at something, there's no way I want to get any better at it. Uh, I'm not going to go there. And you can actually, your organization, you, you can plot everyone, your organization across that continuum. Um, you can absolutely move people up and down the continuum as well. And I would argue that if you keep trying things to improve your happiness, your performance, your leadership, and you fail because those things you're trying are not actually based on cutting edge insights about how your brain works, you're going to be developing more of an eight brain, more of a fixed mindset. If you try things that are based on good science, if you use, for example, habit metrics, um, our habit metric tools and our habit mechanic, habit building tools, you're going to actually improve and get results. And that's what we see in the app, for example, in real time every single day. And that's going to, help you to develop more of a had mechanic mindset, a belief that you can do better. So if we want to do better, if we want to learn, if we want to grow, we have to have that mindset. You know, we hear different um, examples of this. So Clive Woodward, the, I mentioned Clive Woodward before, Sir Clive Woodward now, famous rugby coach, but also head of high performance at the London 2012 Olympic Games where GB, I think, got a record medal haul. He talks about rocks and sponges. So he was trying to pack his team full of sponges, players that wanted to learn and get better, rather than rocks, players that thought they already knew it. So that's a comparable example. The reason that we always... So in The Habit Mechanic, the first section of the book is dedicated to helping you understand how your brain works in very simple terms so that we're not limited by 
false beliefs that it's all about our genetics because it isn't we now know that we can practice we can change and in fact that we're changing our brain every time just by listening to this podcast now right now you are changing your brain because the words that i'm saying are moving into your short-term memory and if they're meaningful or if i'm repeating the same ideas like the nine action factors that's been moved from your short-term memory into your longer-term memory that isn't in your brain as fairy dust it's in there as real biological material they're called neurons and there are about 100 billion of them in your brain and you are changing those neurons every millisecond of every day with what you practice thinking and doing in other words your habits but you can because we have that two percent consciousness if we get our brain working well that's what we can use that consciousness to intercede and to start changing the the neurons in our brain getting rid of some of the unhelpful ones the destructive ones um, the destructive habits and and building new super habits so that's the mindset and that's why we always start by teaching people how their brain works yeah and i think um we talked about as we would go through these nine factors you, you would cite how you might practically implement that to help yourself i think you've done that by saying essentially gain an understanding of the role of mindset and the, and the Clive Woodward rocks and sponges um, example is a fascinating way it was being uh, implemented in the real world. I guess that would apply in, in a business organization to uh, selecting people you bring in. Um, the, the second factor then is what you call brain state optimization, John. Yeah. So uh, just to go back to the mindset one, actually say something that reminds me, reminds me of the, of a conversation I was having the other day, you can use our habit metric tools, for example, to start to identify people with habit mechanic mindsets before you bring them into your business. So we have the IP and the tools to help businesses to do that. So you've got a better chance of getting the right people into the business. So like Woodward was wanting to recruit sponges, we can help you to, to measure that. But yeah, brain optimization. So... We can absolutely learn. We're learning all the time. It's our superpower. I take a deep dive into this in chapter five of the book and even an even deeper dive in chapter 26. But ultimately, if our brain isn't in the right state, it's going to be hard to learn. So there's an optimal brain state for learning. In other words, it's called the high charge brain state. So in chapter 25 of the book, I talk about uh, recharge brain states, medium charge brain states, high charge brain states. That connects with a concept in the book um, called activation, which I introduced in chapter 21. For me, activation is, is as important as sleep, diet, and exercise. But just to give a practical example here, if I want to learn to drive and I try to learn to drive when I'm sleep deprived, it's not going to be a very efficient and effective use of my time. So if we want to build new habits to give ourselves the best chance, we've got to be practicing those new behaviors, those new ways of thinking and doing when our brain is has got plenty of charge in it. So we think of, of the brain as a bit like a battery. So if we can, we want to design our day so that we're in high charge brain states when we, first of all, um, start to practice this new way of thinking and doing to start building a new habit. That's why, for example, we encourage people to do the tea plan first thing in the morning um, because hopefully they've had a restful night's sleep and therefore they've got enough um, brain charge to help them to do that. The tea plan is the first habit mechanic tool that we introduce. It's chapter one of the book. It's also you'll see people in the habit mechanic university out there posting their tea plans every day. So yeah, so that's brain states. It's about getting the right neurotransmitters into your brain. And the first thing I do every day is I go for a run. And I go for a run so that I can, when I get to my desk to do my focused, clever work, I'm at the right brain state. I've got the right neurotransmitters in, in my brain. I've got some dopamine. I've got some neuroadrenaline. I've got some BDNF so that I've got the best chance of, of doing my my um most challenging work. 
So that's how I would explain brain states. And it's also worth saying that in chapter 18, I, I go into lots of detail about um, all of these nine factors. Yeah, and, and obviously uh, you, you've highlighted what we can do. Um, I guess, John, any any form of movement or exercise will help with that. Uh, if people could establish a routine um, around some exercise prior to starting the working day, you think that would be a, a reasonable way of going about it? Yeah, well, we're, we're thinking about building new habits. So the thing to think about is that if your brain isn't working very well, it's going to be hard to to learn a new habit. So that means good sleep, good diet, good exercise. These are the cornerstones of good brain function. You know, and this is why, for example, being productive. So everyone wants to be more productive, be more focused, be less distracted. Um, but they don't always make the connection that in order to do that, they're going to have to sleep better, eat better, exercise properly, get good at managing stress, probably get good at uh, managing confidence you know the the then the 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 productivity stuff the, you you build that on top of that so we've got to always bear in mind that if we want to make positive change in our life we need to get our brain working really well and that's why in step three of the book the habit mechanic toolkit the first thing that we tackle is good sleep good diet good exercise where we introduce the diet, exercise, and sleep swap, self watch and plan tool. Um, and we show you how to create their swaps so you can actually start to monitor, but also deliberately build new sleep, diet, exercise habits every day. Yeah, and it's well worth checking that section of the book out as well. It's uh, I know you have countless examples of, of people using that and implementing that successfully in their lives. I don't think we need to to dwell on that particularly. But uh, m moving on then through the factors, we'll move to number three, um, the idea of recognizing that you can change yourself, but but these changes shouldn't be massive. They shouldn't be gargantuan in it shouldn't be a, a massive step taken at one time yeah so this is the tiny factor and um in the book i i cite where i get these where i where i learned about these insights from and this is from bj fogg's work who's at stanford university i think or harvard he's a bit he's a behavioral scientist there i think uh at one of those institutes but this is also a good point because the reason we created the non-action factor model is because we couldn't find anything out there that we felt explained why people do what they do. What we have in the behavioral science, lots of people say, we use behavioral science. We're using a behavioral science approach. Behavioral science is a, is a very dispersed science with lots of different experts promoting lots of niche ideas and saying that their niche idea explains everything about why we do what we do. So Tiny Factors is BJ Fogg's work. Tiny, fa Tiny Factors is key as part of a systematic approach to changing your behavior, but just making things tiny by itself doesn't explain everything about how we get good at building better habits. We've, also, we've already said we need to have the right mindset and we need to get our brain in the right place. But then the Tiny Factors are important to pay attention to so we have the tiny empower and action plan, the T plan, very deliberate. We focus in the way we structure the habit mechanic book, the app, it's all designed to break things into tiny little steps. Um, because our brain's number one operating rule is to save energy. So our brain doesn't like doing difficult things. So one way to get around that is to ask, is to make the things that we're asking our brain to do as tiny as possible. Like the T plan, just spend two minutes a day doing that simple reflection and planning tool that's that is science that is science backed and it's taken quite a long time to put something so simple together. But it's um it's deliberately tiny. If I wanna build up to doing 50 press ups every morning. I'm going to, and I don't currently do any, and I haven't done any for a while, I'm not going to start with 50 press-ups. 
I'm going to start with one press up. And then tomorrow I might do one or I might do two. And then I'll build up this week and maybe by the end of the week, I'm doing five every morning. Great, great start. Fantastic. I'm making progress. And that, that's the other key is that I would argue that the, the fundamental thing that human beings are subconsciously interested in is feeling like they have control of their lives. I think that's the most important thing for us. And we measure that in a few ways. We measure that with how we feel. We measure that with how what we think other people think of us. But that's why progress is so key, is because it it indicates to us that we're in control, that when we put efforts into something, we get a result. We know, for example, that there's, there's big compelling sets of data showing that the biggest cause of burnout in the workplace isn't having too much stuff to do it's the feeling that nothing i do pays off that nothing i do moves me forward that nothing i do has a positive impact so it's that feeling of i'm stagnant or i'm going backwards so by making things tiny it allows us to quickly get some change momentum is what i would call it so that's the tiny factor yeah, fascinating. Um, the next factor then, number four, personal motivation. You, you tell people to think about a meaningful reason or a desire that what why they want to change. Yeah, and again, it's really interesting because many people I speak to, really well-intended people that have read some good books and they've, they've been led to believe and they've bought into the idea, the real driver as to why anyone does what they do, do is the why. If you can't do something, your why isn't strong enough. To which I say, well, why is important, but it's only one of nine factors. So I might have all the motivation in the world to want to do something, but if my brain's not working well, and I haven't designed that thing that I want to do into manageable chunks, then you know the why is going to fail me of, eventually or if i can't activate the other nine factors the other, the other eight factors the why will fail but yeah why is important because our brain is designed for the next 10 minutes our brain's a survival organ it's interested in the next 10 minutes of course to make sustainable improvements to our habits build get rid of destroy destructive habits and build new super habits we need to do things beyond the next 10 minutes we need to prioritize our feelings beyond the next 10 minutes. So being able to connect what we want to practice today and tomorrow and the rest of the week and so on becomes easier if we can connect it to our bigger goals. And this is why we created over many, many iterations and many, many years, the FAM story iceberg, which is the future ambitious, meaningful story iceberg. So the iceberg is a metaphor the top of the iceberg is the distant future. The bottom of the iceberg is today. So the fam story iceberg gives you a really quick, powerful way to connect your long-term distant goals with your habits today and the habits that you're trying to work on. So that's, that's fully explained, and we show you how to do that in Chapter 16 of the book. Yeah, and then but, worthwhile just pointing out, John, you work with people and in the book. This is actually, this is this becomes a, a diagram, if you like, that people can use and take with them somewhere. Yes, yeah, so it's a visual reference point. Um, so the metaphor is the iceberg. Um, and you'll be able to do it in the app as well soon, actually. You'll be able to. I was showing someone that the other day, which is quite exciting. So you can store that. But the a quick way to make something more a goal more meaningful is to ask yourself why times five. So you might say, okay, well, my goal um, in the next 12 months is to get a promotion at work. Why do you want to do that? Well, I want to buy a house in a different part of town. Why do you want to do that? Well, that that part of town has the best school district. Why is that important? Because I want to give my kids the, the chance of going to the best school. Well, why is that important? Because I want to be a great parent. I don't want to look back and, and regret not giving my kids the best chance. 
So what do you need to do in order to give yourself the chance of getting a promotion at work in the next year? Well, every day I need to create a willpower story. So all of a sudden creating a willpower story every day is much more meaningful because it's not about just getting the promotion. It's about being a great parent. So that's the power of knowing how to properly set what we call intelligent goals. Goals are powerful tools, but you can set goals that are really, well, I, I would argue quite damaging to the to you being successful, or you can set goals that are really intelligent and really supercharge your success. And we would, you know, talking about um, making habits of things, I would really encourage people to, so all, all the tools in the book, are broken down into daily tools, weekly tools, and monthly tools or bi-monthly tools. So the fam story is a is a monthly bi-monthly tool. And we actually have a we have a business version of that in the book as well. Um, which is in chapter 32, the cultural architect chapter. It's a very similar idea, but you can use it for your business. So yeah, personal motivation is key. Um and, and remember, just to reinforce these factors I'm talking about are on all the time. They're always on at an individual level, at a team level, at an organizational level. They're driving individually, they're driving your personal habits. At a team level, they're driving your team's level, uh, your team's habits. At an organizational level, they're driving your people's habits. In other words, your culture. Your culture is your people's habits. Habits run your business. That's really important to reinforce, I think. That might be uh, quite alarming for people to hear and uh, they, they might want to uh, pay uh, further attention uh, to, to the rest of our podcast and, and and clearly get themselves a copy of The Habit Mechanic. But um, we'll move through the factors, John. Um, you talked early in the podcast about why knowledge and skills are not enough uh, when you were you were examining the, the current coaching practices that that are prevalent and 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 quite widespread but they do play a role they do play a role nevertheless and you you, you discuss this and um uh, as you have list them uh, factors five and six well, i think we can tackle them perhaps together um personal knowledge and skills is factor five um you you need to know new things and community knowledge and skills people around you might know new things which are helpful yeah, so we can give a couple of examples here. Yeah, so absolutely, it's knowledge, it's knowing, to skill, to habit, or knowing, doing, which is doing is putting the skill into action, to habit. That's the continuum. It's not saying that knowing stuff, we don't say knowing stuff isn't important or that skills are not important. You, in our book, from the word go, we start to map out that sequence. What we're saying is that the way that we've traditionally been taught to help people often doesn't get past giving them more knowledge. Sometimes we give them a few more skills, particularly in you know sports psychology, which is my background is really strong in that aspect of it, but it stops then of actually helping them to build new habits. So just to give a simple example, you might have all the motivation. You might be absolutely aligned with your why, but without new knowledge and skills, you won't be able to do it. That's why you have driving lessons. You might have all the motivation in the world to want to get better at managing stress, but often without new knowledge and skills, you don't know how to do it. That's why I wrote The Habit Mechanic. Read chapter 22. It gives you the knowledge and the skills to be able to get better at managing stress. But we also go that step further and show you how to build that into a habit. And yeah, closely connected to personal knowledge and skills, as you, as you say, Andrew, is community knowledge and skills. So it's really helpful when we want to learn new things, if people around us already know how to do it. So in that driving example, if I want to learn how to drive, it's really helpful if my parents know how to do it because they can take me for a free driving lessons at the weekend in the supermarket car park before they used to open on the the weekend on Sunday. So you can probably still get there in after four o'clock or something. Um, equally, if I want to get better at managing stress, it's really helpful if people around me know how to do it. And this is what's fantastic. And this is why we've created the habit mechanic language, which is chapter um, three of the book. And we're going to do an entire podcast about that. But one of the other great things I love about the habit mechanic community app is that we've got people 
in there saying, I'm struggling with this. And then someone else jumps in and says, oh, I, I've, I've been using this tool. Or I've tried this. So we've got the community knowledge and skills in the app are actually supercharging individuals' abilities to start uh, building and securing long-lasting new behaviors. So we're seeing that in real time in the Habit Mechanic University app. And it's no coincidence that we've structured the app and the book, which work together as we have done, because we've done it to try to activate as many of the nine action factors as we possibly can to give, to create that ecosystem around you, around your team, around your organization that gives you the best chance of actually building new habits. Okay, uh, we'll move on then, John, to the seventh factor, social influence. You you talk about the strong influence uh, that, that can be, we can have we can, that, that people can have on us with their own behavior and especially if we look up to them and respect them yeah so if we think about the driving example again we've got um uh, someone who wants to learn to be a great driver but their father doesn't think the speed limit's a valid idea or their mother doesn't believe in car insurance they're not great role models for you learning to become a great driver so we model and copy we have you know, a part of our brain that's wired, it's actually hardwired into the parts of our brain that tells us we are thirsty and we are hungry. It's like a social uh, thermometer. It tells us how, how we think other people are perceiving us and thinking about us, which is the P in the eight brain, essentially. So we are highly wired to want to fit in and want to impress important people in our lives. We're seeing great examples of this at the moment in the England cricket team with Ben Stokes. Ben Stokes, essentially, he, he said in a press conference, if you want to get into this England cricket team, this is the style you're going to need to play in, which is a really aggressive, attacking, uh, batting style. He's going out there and modelling that behaviour every time he takes the field. He's probably doing it excessively. Um, he's probably giving his, his wicket away some commentators would say, you know, a bit too easily at times, but what he's what he's doing is he's making a point is I want you to be super aggressive when you're batting and I'm going to lead from the front and model that behavior. You know, when we look at how do how how to become a better leader, so our leadership model has four components: the role model, the action communicator, the cultural architect, and the SWAT coach. When we're thinking about people being in traditional sort of leadership training, it's often about what can we, what can we, what can we be doing to help uh, to get others to do what we want them to do. And often the blind spot is, well, it's you. You embody those behaviors yourself. You model the behaviors that you want others to do is the first thing that you can do. So if you want others to become habit mechanics, first of all, you need to become a habit mechanic. Another example I like is is um is James Dyson. Um the, who, the, the, the inventor of the Dyson vacuum. Inventor of the Dyson vacuum, um now worth twenty six billion. <laughs> um seriously successful uh, entrepreneur who has created some you know phenomenal products and they continue to do so. But at the center of his business is failing. So if people know what Dyson is, they also often know that he fit that to create the cyclonic vacuum cleaner, he failed over over 5,000 times. And there's a number they put on that, an exact number. And he's saying to his engineering team, in order to get good, don't worry about failing. It's essential for getting good. And I, I'm, I'm failing all the time. You know, it's important for me to, to reinforce for the habit mechanic community that I'm not perfect. I'm not nailing this all the time. I'm failing. I'm making mistakes. I'm learning and I continue to learn. You know, my habit mechanic intelligence is growing all the time because I make mistakes and I, and I learn from setbacks. There's another example in the book. Actually, I can't recall the lady's name. She's in a, a famous film called um, Hidden Figures. She's one of the characters in, in Hidden Figures. Um, 
Now, oh, that's that's a great film, isn't it? That's about the role that uh, African-American women played in the, the space program. And as you see, it's called Hidden Figures and uh, it, their role uh, in, in some of the, um, well, cutting edge developmental aspects of America's successful space program at the time when they were, well, in the Cold War and competing with the Soviet Union in the space race, uh, their role was unknown. Yeah, so the the one of the protagonists that stands out in that, and she might actually be the main protagonist of the film, is Mary Jackson. Um, and she, um, against all the odds, I, I think she becomes the first female NASA engineer. Or, and she really then goes on to pioneer, um, yeah, the, the work of, of having an, an equality in, in that workforce, essentially. But um, that's worth checking out in terms of role model social influence. Yeah, so that's social influence. I hope that's given uh, an insight into what that means. Yeah, absolutely, John. It has. And and, and two factors left to discuss then. Uh, number eight, rewards and penalties. And, and you highlight how these can uh, encourage or discourage behaviour. Yeah, so again, these are always on. In the driving example, we get rewarded for driving well, if pass our test we get our license we continue to drive well we get to keep our license our car insurance goes down if we drive poorly there's a penalty system you might not get your driving license in the first instance if you do and you drive poorly you get points on your license you get um, monetary fines your car insurance goes up eventually you lose a license so these there are these reward and penalty systems around us all the time they're quite complex i go into quite a a bit of detail in the book we actually have um our own system that we use with our clients which is, which is called the which is called the habit power um process and it breaks these non-action factors down into about 250 tactics and we maybe have about 30 plus reward and penalty tactics that we use to help clients um to create these systems in their organizations and for themselves but we can broadly break down reward and penalty systems into three core areas, uh, intrinsic rewards and penalties. So if I do this, I feel better or I feel worse. Extrinsic. So if I do this, I get something tangible for it or I don't. And then a social reward. So if I do this, I'm, I'm better thought of by the people around me. So it increases my social status essentially. And we know that, you know, certain reward and penalty systems are more um, interesting to humans than others. So we know that variable variable rewards are very um, seductive, which variable rewards run the gambling industry, which is becoming a huge problem, you know, gambling addiction, um, people developing that destructive habit. It's run by variable rewards. Variable rewards are just, um, you don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes you, you win, sometimes you lose. That, of course, was uh, driven by um, Skinner's research on pigeons, where he observed. So he had, he had pigeons um, with feeding tubes and essentially set up some different experimental conditions. So if a pigeon pressed the button, the some food came out. It always came out. So what did what happened? Did, did the pigeon keep persisting? Did it get bored after a while? What happened in that condition? He had another condition where, where the pigeon pressed the button, nothing happened, no food ever came out. And they had a middle condition where when the pigeon pressed the button, sometimes food came out, sometimes it didn't come out. And essentially the pigeons got almost a, addicted to pressing the button. And that's how we first started to understand the power of variable rewards. Um, I would argue that that's about controlling our environment um, but that's probably for another podcast. But yeah, so reward penalty systems are very complex in one one sense, but they're, they're also quite simple in another sense. We've got a really good handle on them, a tougher minds and something that we really help our clients to, to dig into. It's much easier to um, understand the reward and penalty systems in your own life if you've got a detailed fam story. So there's some interconnectivity be between what am I going to get? What's the reward of, of this, of building this particular habit? If I can connect it to my 
meaningful goals or what's the penalty if I don't um, build this particular habit? Okay, um, we'll come on to the ninth and final factor then, external triggers. Uh, and you highlight that setting up these triggers is a key way to, to really start to cement helpful habits. Yeah, so we're being triggered all the time. Um, if we use the driving example, when we're driving, governments have worked out if they don't keep reminding us what to do, or in other words, triggering us what to do, um, then we make mistakes. Car accident rates go through the roof. And again, this is um, drawing on the nudge theory. Um, but again, you know, nudging and triggering is one explanation, is, is one of nine factors that drive what we do. It doesn't, in many contexts, I've seen people trying to use nudge to explain everything about why people do what they do. It only explains uh, one of nine factors. And you can, you can interconnect these ideas. You know, sometimes uh, uh, you can have, so for example, if we take the driving example, a speed camera is a reward and penalty trigger. So you can start to plug different aspects together. There's actually someone created something called the speed cam camera lot lottery. They took it one step further. So if you drove past the speed camera at the correct um, speed, you got entered into a lottery which was all the fine money collected together from everybody that drove past the speed camera at the incorrect speed <laughs> and breaking the speed limit. So that takes a reward, that, that, that supercharges um, a trigger into a super reward and penalty system. So, but when you're driving, you're getting triggered all the time. So if you don't put your seatbelt on now in a modern car, you get a ping, ping, ping to remind you to do that. You have a speedometer in your car, reminding you how quickly you're driving. There is literally a, a line in the middle of the road to remind you which side to drive on. There are uh, speed cameras, as I just said. There are crossings, zebra crossings we have in the UK. There are police cars or cop cars. There are just there's signage just everywhere designed to remind you what to do. Probably the most powerful trigger that's ever been designed is the smartphone. It's designed to remind you to use it to the extent now that sometimes you think you've got um, a mess. If you've got your phone in your pocket, sometimes you think it's vibrated. You get a phantom vibration because it's just a twinge in your leg and you've been now conditioned to associate that twinge with a message on your phone. So the reason that um, smartphones have been so successful is because they're so good at triggering you what to do, at reminding you to check them, in other words. And they're loaded with reward and penalty systems. They're like reward. They're like variable reward uh, systems. So we're always being reminded what to do. That's again why we created the app. So you've got, we you know we we can't get rid of distractive smartphones. We've got to harness them and and, and make it easier for people to get more out of them. That's why we've got the Habit Mechanic University app, which you can get onto your smartphone dashboard via the App Store or the Google Play Store. Um. You can control the notifications. You can turn them on or turn them off. You know, again, it's not when you get that little red button, that little red um, notification on your phone, that isn't a coincidence. That's That color is very deliberately designed. We've been conditioned to associate red with danger, so it gets our attention. So you increasingly see that little red dot in your browser on your phone. Also on your phone, if someone's typing a reply to you, it starts to uh, make you aware of that. Now you get a little dot, 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 dot. That's a trigger. It's a variable reward trigger. It's saying something's coming, something's coming in your brain saying, will it be good? Will it be bad? What's going to come? Um, releases a little bit of dopamine response in your brain, which is an anticipatory system, not a reward system like we've been led to believe. We get dopamine in anticipation of a reward. But so that, that's the triggering element. They're always on. These triggering systems are always on. I think the big challenge as we've moved hybrid, we've gone far more digital with work, is that we've we're just now constantly triggered and bombarded by lots of unhelpful things. I think lots of this software that calls itself productivity software, I think it needs to be 
that title needs to be challenged because I think it makes you less productive. And it seems to me that those sorts of softwares are more interested in getting you to use them all the time rather than it actually helping you to be more productive. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour to the nine action factors. Remember, they're always on. It's about getting as it's about trying to get as many of them to work for you as possible. I, I think of behavior. Behavior is just what we think and do on a continuum. One end is simple behaviors, things like worrying, beating yourself up, eating more donuts, watching more Netflix, checking your phone more often. If you want to build more simple behaviors, which are, I can't think of one that's simple behaviors that are really helpful for your health, your happiness, your performance, off, off the top of my head, um, you'd have to worry about nine action factors because they're already stacked way in your favor to doing those things. The other end of the continuum is complex behaviors. This is things like learning to drive is a good example because it's a complex behavior, but managing stress, becoming a better leader, building better sleep habits, building better uh, confidence habits, being more focused and productive. When you want to build more complex behaviors and a behavior is a seed for a habit. If you keep repeating the behavior, you turn it into a, into a habit. Um, then you've got to use the nine action factors. And actually, you know, we'll, we'll cover this in another episode, but just to point out here, so we say, okay, the nine action factors, wow, well, that's, that's a lot of detail. But actually what sits in the middle of the nine action factors is our proprietary habit loop, which is the trait habit loop. Trait is an acronym. So we've got our own proprietary habit loop that these nine factors are wired into. Um, so we can go we can go a step deeper into how we explain the science behind this. But the good news, Andrew, is, is that if you want to start practicing activating the nine action factors, that's why we created the habit building plan, which is a central part of the book. So at the end of every um, chapter in step three of the book, the habit mechanic tools chapter, we show you an example habit building plan. So if you want to build better sleep, diet, exercise habits, stress management habits, productivity habits, confidence habits, performing under pressure habits, habits around your leadership, the book is packed full of examples of those plans. Yeah, and, and having seen that all that and and the tools you described, John, um, they are extremely sophisticated in their design and in the science that they rely on, but very practical and very accessible to use. So I, I would uh, I would point that out to people uh, the the practicality and accessibility of all the tools you'll find in the Habit Mechanic and the Habit Mechanic University app. Um, really, really important. Well, John, thanks so much for going through those nine factors in, in the detail that you have and explaining and and bringing them to life for us and of course uh, as we said at the start you've written about all this in the Forbes magazine article that we've we've focused on today as the basis for this podcast worth pointing out you're a member also of the Forbes coaches council which is a an invitation only community um and if people did want to read the Forbes article it's linked on the top of minds website if you go um to the top of minds website and look at media articles and podcasts you'll see a link to the Forbes article so it's accessible there as well for people okay well john it's time to uh look at a question that we've had and again just a reminder for people please do submit your questions to us via the tougher minds website tougherminds.co.uk and, and we'll answer them on the podcast you can win uh, a year's free subscription to the premium level of the habit mechanic university app when it becomes available something really worthwhile doing and and you can as a starting point, download the Habit Mechanic University app for free. So um, please do submit your questions. Um, this is a question um, I think we've had in from um, a lady called Jan, um, connects to what we've been talking about today, John. Uh, Jan asks, how do we manage persistent distractions? I'm sure that's something many other people would ask too. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And it's a question that we're led to believe that if we get a few quick tips and a few tricks, we'll be able to nail this. So I'm distracted all the time. I can't get clear focus on what I want to do. We've been led to believe that if we could just know a bit more about some quick tips and quick tricks, maybe get a few little skills, 
then we're not going to be distracted anymore. We're going to get much more focus. To me, that just sounds absurd now, the idea. Where most of what we're doing is habitual, mindless behavior. We don't do what we know we should do. We do what we're in the habit of doing. So to really tackle that question, we've got to put habits at the heart of it. Um, and, you know, the short answer is read the Habit Mechanic book because that is deliberately structured to help you to get to the point where you can actually be more focused and do more in less time. And it, it's a jigsaw puzzle. We've got to build better habits around our sleep, our diet and our exercise. So our brain is working really well. Connected to that, we've got to have good ways of managing stress so we can get our prefrontal cortex working really well, which is where we're going to do the, the deep focus. Um, we might have to work on our confidence as well, again, so our limbic regions are not dominating the brain. So once we've got a nice, calm, um, quiet, well-functioning brain, then we can start to use insights from productivity and focus, which is in chapter 25 of the book. We need to understand our brain states. We need to understand a, co a concept called activation. And it's also really helpful, we found, to break the work that you're doing down into what we call building ice sculptures, which is high charge work, or freezing ice cubes, which is medium charge work. And essentially, we've created a tool in um, which we show in chapter 25 to, to bring all that stuff together. It's called the willpower story. So I would say that the, the best way to get better at being focused and managing distractions is to use the willpower story every day. And in fact, my daily tea plan is to create a willpower story. So that's what I do. I timeline my day and I use things like willpower strengths, willpower boosters, but I also use understandings about my brain states, activation levels. Um, I deliberately separate the jobs that I'm doing into two categories. I dedicate a specific time to each job, et cetera. So in one way, it's quite simple, create a willpower story, but there's lots of learning to do behind that because you, you've got to, you've got to do lots of, yeah, lots of work to do. In, to get that insight about yourself, about your brain states, about your activation levels. So it's absolutely possible, but don't just think it's about turning your phone off or something. It's going to be going back to the basics of getting your brain working really well. And at the end of chapter 25, I create a habit building plan. I think the example habit building plan is to create a willpower story every day. So I show you how you can get the nine action factors working for you um, to create the willpower story. And this actually brings me on to, um, so essentially part of what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm giving some coaching. I'm coaching you and obviously everybody who's listening to this has got a different, slightly different challenge, but I'm trying to give you some coaching advice. And this is why I'm really excited at the moment that we are, training people to become certified habit mechanic coaches so that they can use they can learn how to use our proprietary uh, habit metric assessment tools so that they can help their clients their teams their people to identify their destructive habits they learn how to use our award-winning habit mechanic toolkit toolkit so that they can they can help their clients, their people, their team start to build new super habits. I'm working with everyone who's training to be a certified habit mechanic coach one-to-one. -one. So you work with me for 10 hours um, over six core sessions. We've got such a fantastic range of people that are doing this at the moment, working at elite academic institutes, elite high performance institutes, people who've got their own coaching businesses, people who've just got their own businesses that want to embed this into what they do. We're working with um, HR professionals, uh, chief uh, people officers. So if you're interested in learning how to use the mechanic toolkit to help your clients, your people, your team, 
if you're interested in learning how to use the habit mechanic approach strategically in your organization, get in touch via the website. Let's have a conversation. Um, what you also get as part of the certification is we give you some books. We give your people access to the premium version of the app so you can get them using these tools straight away and practice you know, your coaching skills with them. You go up on our website as a certified habit mechanic coach. So you look, join an elite group of people that we're working with to, to do that. And then if you want us to, we'll happily promote you to our database to, to champion the work that you're doing. We have about 10,000 people on our database. Um, we're not accepting everyone onto this program, but we're happy to have a conversation with everyone. So if you think this could be useful for you, for your business, uh, for your clients, for your people, for your team, then get in touch. Let's have a conversation. Um, yeah, and even if it's not 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 the right time for you to do this program right now, it would still uh, be good to have a chat. So yeah. Well, John, thanks uh, for that. Fascinating to talk once again. Um, don't forget, everyone, please do like, share, subscribe to this podcast. Leave us a review on the podcast platform where you access us and let us know what you think. If you've got any questions, please do submit them via the Tougher Minds website, tougherminds.co.uk, and we'll answer them on this podcast. And you could win um, a year's free subscription to the Habit Mechanic University app. And of course, John, worth mentioning just one final time that uh, the new Tougher Minds talks are now available and you'll be delivering one at St. George's Park later this week the uh, football association's uh, performance center in england um and uh, the the insights uh, you cover we've covered in this podcast also uh, very much form the basis of those keynote addresses which are uh, really have a high impact and probably like no keynote people have ever seen before again you can find all the details on the tougher minds website john anything else you'd like to say in conclusion Yes, well, thanks for listening, first of all. If you've got the book, continue to read it. If you've already read it, reread it, because it's, it's a manual for life, it's a toolkit for success. If you're not already on the app, get on there, see what other people are doing. It brings this to life. If you are on there, please do like, comment, post. All that stuff is really helping other people to be at their best, so that's also really helpful for you because helping others we know is really, really beneficial. Thanks for listening today. We're going to talk more about the book um, next week. But if you are working on yourself, you have identified that one area that if you think, if I can crack that area, that's going to, that's going to be really helpful for me. Keep persisting because building new habits is a journey go back to the nine action factors and think about what, what what have I got working for me here? What, what have I got working for me here? What What's working against me? And use the habit building plans just to reassess what you're doing. Ultimately, our brains run us and our brains are run by habits. So we need to keep in mind that we're only ever one habit away. <laughs>